All right, let's look at some of the remaining cool features of Flow. In our last tutorial, we did some very basic exploration of what you can do with a screen. Now, as you can see, there's a lot of different screen components that you can use. And I'm not going to go into each one of them, uh, but some of them are uh, very simple, like the checkbox we looked at. For example, you can put a date field. Uh, and some of them are quite rich uh, and powerful, like dependent pick lists, which allows you to point at uh, an existing dependent pick list pair of fields that you've configured and have those show up in flow and then get both values out and, in, in, in fact, be able to do that to three levels of depth. So some of these components are uh, have their own little icon there. They're the traditional components. The ones with the lightning bolt are newer flow screen components built with lightning technology and they are uh, divided into a set of input values that you can specify and then a set of outputs that you get out of the component for use later on in the flow. And just like we showed in earlier examples, you temporarily store the values coming out of one of these components uh, when you want to use them downstream later in the flow. You also have the ability to install into your org custom screen components. I've got a whole bunch of them here. On this one I've got more than 60 uh, and you can see there's all sorts of them. For example, we've got a lookup component here uh, that you can add uh, for uh, adding a lookup field uh, and these are available. Some of them are starting to become available on App Exchange. Others are available on the unofficial community uh, Lightning Flow site that uh, we'll provide a link to at the end of this tutorial. So there's a lot you can do here with screens, and we're very busy coming out with more screen components as fast as we can. And then here you can see how you can go to the App Exchange. We have a section for Flow called Flow Solutions on the App Exchange and you can see there is a lot of interesting powerful technology here uh, to solve special purpose problems. Uh, uh, for example, uh, Flow Magic pick lists, Flow ver phone verification, a couple different ways to send an SMS message, uh, and then Flow Actions. Let's talk a little about Flow Actions. So here, for example, is a set of Flow Actions that you can install that allow you to interact with Jira, Confluence, and Slack. That's one of the powerful things Flow can do is interact with non-Salesforce systems. So to take a look at that, let's move out of screen mode and let's go take a look down here in the actions section. So you can see there's several kinds of actions here. So let's take a look at core actions. Core actions are a wide variety of things that you can add to the flow. Some of them are very special purpose, like this first one here, activate a session-based permission set. Uh, that is very specific. If we click on it, you'll see that like all actions, it basically lets you specify inputs, letting you either type in a value or use a temporary storage variable to pull something in from upstream in the flow. And in some cases, and not in this one, there are output values that you may want to use downstream in the flow. Uh, and, you know, we used a core action, you may, you may recall, from uh, our first tutorials to send an email. Uh, and there are other ones here, show a toast, get a toast to pop up, post to chatter can be very useful. Uh, here are some uh, things that, it, that quickly create new tasks, leads, contacts, and cases, much in the same way that you can do that uh, from a quick action on a regular record page. Uh, there are some custom local actions that I've built and create, added to this org so, so that you can add your own core actions as well. Uh, so a lot you can choose from here and more that you can install.
from app exchange. Now, Apex actions are actions that are created using Salesforce's Apex programming language. So this, this is where you can take code and turn it into flow building blocks. So for example, we have a brand new set of flow actions here that uh, interact with Quip. So let's suppose, for example, we can do a little filter here and see all of the Quip actions that are available. Let's suppose that you want to get some data out of a Quip sheet uh, and use it somewhere, use it downstream in your flow, maybe update some Salesforce records or put it into an email that you're sending to someone. And so we can add this action and you can see here there's a lot of things I can I can set. There's the sheet name right here where I can specify the name of my Quip sheet. Uh, I'm not going to go into details here. We've got a whole nother video just on how to use the Quip flow actions uh, that you can find from the Flow unofficial blog uh, at the unofficial Flow site. Uh, so the main takeaway here is that Apex actions, all of these flow actions were written in Apex and then they were turned into these building blocks. And when you add one to a screen, like so, uh, and give it some information. I'm just test example, just, just to show you. It will show up as an element. So we're taking blocks of code, and then who the person who wrote the code made it an action, and now you, all the rest of us can use it uh, with just point and click tools. And so that's one of the most powerful things about Flow, the ability to take code and turn it into building blocks. Email alerts are kind of special purpose email tools that use uh, our older workflow technology. Apex Action Legacy refers to an older Apex Action technology. Uh, you may have some of these in your org. If not, just ignore this. Subflows are worth mentioning. They're extremely powerful. As you start to build more powerful flows, you want to be able to avoid repetition. You want to be able to reuse pieces of work in subsequent flows. So when you put a subflow out, it basically lets you pick from existing flows uh, and just use that whole flow. So for example, uh, if I have this query oracle on AWS flow that does all of this stuff and it's got an AWS user ID and I uh, am going to call this, let's give it a similar name. So I can add this in as a subflow and essentially hook it up when, my, when this flow runs it will launch this flow, completely execute it, and then return back here to keep going. So this is extremely powerful in simplifying, allowing you to do more with your flow technology. The pause screen element, which used to be called wait, lets you stop a flow and, and causes it to restart when a particular event has happened. So the way this works is you define you define your pause element and you create one or more pause configurations. A pause configuration consists essentially of these two parts. The conditions that will cause the flow to pause and then if, you, if, if those conditions are met, the conditions that will cause the flow to resume. So for example, we start out by saying that we're always going to pause when we get to this element, uh, but maybe we're going to resume at a specific time uh, and we're going to resume at uh, the 10th day of 2019. And oh, got to give it a label, my uh, configuration. All right, so what's going to happen here is when this flow gets to 
the pause element, it's going to look at each of the pause configurations, and you can create several of them. It's going to evaluate the conditions one at a time, and it's going to say, should I pause or not? And in this case, we're definitely pausing. And then if it pauses, it's going to, it's going to wait, if necessary, for years uh, until either that specific time is reached or until a platform event uh, message is received. Let's look. There's just a couple more resources I'd like to draw attention to. One of the one powerful thing you can do is, is set up a formula. Formulas are very powerful because they can tap into all of the functions that are available in sales. Let me show you an example of a formula. I'm going to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius. So to start with, let me go here. I've got a screen and I'm going to add a number field. And I'm going to call this, uh, label this, enter temperature in Fahrenheit. And let's allow people to enter up to two decimal points. And now I want to create a formula that converts that. So let's go here to formula and I'd say I want, my, I want to do this. And let's call this convert Fahrenheit to Celsius. And then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to grab that temperature in Fahrenheit. That's a number. And I am going to apply the formula for conversion, which is this. You may remember from grade school. And so let's, to display that, let's add another screen called Celsius temperature. And let's go get some display text. And let's say, let's say Celsius temperature is, and let's insert that formula. And let's hook that up and let's run it. So if it is a uh, warm 77 degrees, the Celsius correspondence is 25. And that's pretty good. Now, I mentioned how you can use Salesforce functions. Uh, I don't have time here to show you more details, but there are a lot of functions that you can take advantage of, uh, and almost all of these run in flow.